It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 252 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 18th of December 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Lucas Randall. Oh! Clinical nurse consultant and radiation oncology trial coordinator and budding (laughs) ethicist... Person who likes ethics, it's Joe Benamu. Hi, Ed. Thank you for the lovely introduction. <laughs> and all he wants for Christmas is for it to not be Christmas. It's Dr. Shane Joseph. G'day, all. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ed. <laughs> yes, if you've been anywhere near a shop recently, you'll know it's Christmas time, and that means it's the end of 2016. The year that brought us Trump, (laughs) Brexit, the Zika virus, and killed off nearly all your favourite celebrities. Fingers (laughs) crossed for David Attenborough. Fingers crossed. And don't say that out loud. What are you doing? Just say it out loud. It's like saying no. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. <laughs> don't. No, but I cross my fingers, so that cancels it out. That's I read it in a book of superstition. I saw a great meme today, courtesy of uh, Diane, our, our mutual friend Diane, who uh, posted. It was it, it picture uh, an episode of Arrested Development, and it started with me. Wow, twenty sixteen is so going to be my year. Narrator, twenty sixteen was in fact nobody's year. <laughs> <laughs> And at the same time, Keith Richards just turned, just, you know, made another revolution under the sun today. Now, it's he Keith is Richards. holding the fabric of the universe together. I, I honestly think that yeah. he, no, I think he's a Highlander. Oh. I think that's the, that's the only explanation yeah. I have. <laughs> oh, God. There can be only one, and it's Keith <laughs> Richards? Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's uh, get down to business. This is our last episode of the year, which means it's time to have a look back at some of the big stories or the stories that we found the most interesting of 2016. And I think really there's no better way to start off than with the gravitational waves. Uh, We've had two discoveries now confirming that we've actually detected gravitational waves, which is opening the doors to a whole new method of astronomy. Yeah, absolutely. Because prior to this, it, this was one of the uh, the last standing predictions of Einstein that hadn't been confirmed. Um, yep, tick, another one <laughs> done. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so, so the the big issue with uh, with gravitational waves, if if you recall from when we covered the story uh, earlier in the year, was well, um, three or just four how, times in the last two years. I think. Yeah. How how and how do you detect the damn things? Um, you know, because they're not they're not going to be very big. And so this is where the uh, LIGO experiment came in in over in the US, and um, <laughs> they managed to detect something that was uh, basically a ripple in space time that was on the order of I think it was a thousandth of a was that a thousandth of the width of an atom or something ridiculously yes, of small the width like of that. a proton the nucleus of an atom <laughs> that's just <laughs> mental um and you know we, we went through all the details back then but i mean what an incredible experiment and to to have a detection quite early uh in in the piece once they enabled it and we you know we talked about how the the um, ligo uh, instrument has set up before which is really really cool but really quite straightforward in terms of the the, the principle of the thing but can you just imagine measuring something so ridiculously small but the outcome of this detection is that now or well, the first thing is we because we had two detections so close together it does tend to indicate that potentially there are a lot more really really big uh, as in massive black holes out there than we thought and that's that's kind of you know both cool to know and also a little bit scary mm. <laughs> <laughs> but um uh, you know, when you think, uh, I remember back to the the reporting of the story that uh, the sheer size of these these objects was was just stunning. The f- the first detection, there were two objects that were uh, more than thirty times the mass of our sun that that collided, and during the collision, they were accelerated something like thirty percent of the speed of light. So, just 
just the amount of energy that that is involved in such a thing and involved in that merger is just stunning to to think about especially considering how far away they were they were you know basically you know in in galaxies far far away <laughs> <laughs> so um you know to to have so that would mean they would have happened a long time ago yeah, absolutely, uh, and I can't. It's it's a fair, fair <laughs> nicely done. Um, <laughs> in, but uh, you know, and and maybe this. Uh, I I don't think there's been another detection since then. I think we would have heard about it, but um, no, uh, it's it's fantastic. It, it it really it has opened up a new way of detecting things, and you've got to bear in mind that we've we've only ever detected the effects black holes have on their surrounding things before we haven't directly detected a black hole prior to this so that's also amazing yeah and one, one cool. of the things i love about it as you were saying lucas is just how i mean obviously this is you know in order to have um discovered them the the physics involved is incredibly complex but the experiment itself is just so elegant and so just ridiculously simple in in in, in how it's yeah. executed, and I and I and I think that there are so many examples in science where sometimes it is something that is so simple in its execution that actually uncovers something so really quite incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah I totally agree. And and you know when it comes down to thinking of uh, what. Thinking it through, what would what would be the impact of a gravitational wave on 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 our space time, on 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 our local environment, and then thinking that through to okay, there would be a a, a contraction and a stretching mm -hmm. that would occur, um, or a stretching and then contracting. Um, how would we detect that? And then to say okay, well, let's set up lasers that mm -hmm. <laughs> that measure you know the time between this point and that point, and then back over another course, and then we should see that ch that time actually slightly mm -hmm. change as the space in between the lasers gets stretched. It's a really simple, as you said, it's a simple concept, but um, you know, awesome, awesome technology, obviously, and an awesome application of it. But still, really quite straightforward. And then, yeah, we we got a we got a detection really soon after the the, the uh, detector went live. And this is all based on just the one instrument, which is two instruments, but used in conjunction. If we were to have more such detectors built around the world, uh, the sensitivity is going to increase and we're just going to open that doorway to that new method of astronomy even wider, which would be really cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, Herald of the, the, the newly named Gravitational Wave Astronomy, <laughs> which is yeah. nice to have on your business card, I think. <laughs> And the other big astronomy news, I guess, was that we got all the data back from the New Horizons space probe. And uh, it's now been more than a year since the flyby happened uh, in 2015. And we've discovered so much about Pluto. We've discovered clouds. It has a slushy subsurface ocean. All sorts of incredible stuff about what before that was just a fuzzy dot was the best image that we had of it. Which is pretty cool, Lucas. Yeah, um, as you say, there's so many things that have already come out of that mission, and and it was a, a kind of a, um, a a very slow uh, transmission of that that data over the years. So, you know, we were learning things as the year unfolded. It was kind of like when you you know you you discover a show that's still new, so you have to wait until every episode <laughs> yeah. airs. <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> and and that was kind of like yeah, it, it was it made it exciting i think because it, it maintained the interest in it rather than everything sort of being dumped on the media at once but you know we covered a few things we, we talked about the uh the clouds on pluto and the fact that it actually has an atmosphere and what the atmosphere is comprised of we talked about these dark sections on them and what they possibly could be we talked about the mountainous regions on pluto that we we had no expectation of them being there and that the place is uh is, is nine kilometer cliffs uh, Freaking yeah. huge cliffs <laughs> <laughs> it's, made, out of, it's, made out of ice. Yeah, yeah, and 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 then of course most recently we talked about the uh, the slushy ocean below the surface of of the mm -hmm. the slushy. renamed Sputnik. Uh, Planitia, or plenum, as I prefer to call it, because I can say it better. Um, <laughs> um, so this, you know, there's a there's there's a lot going on out there, and and it's a it's a really interesting world. And and when you when you consider, I guess the this search for 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 life out 
you know, beyond beyond Earth, we have to think about all of the possible environments where life may exist. And and Pluto has become a potential place that could harbor life. We 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 do know that that certainly within our experience on Earth, on the on the one you know data point that we have, that that water is is important for life. And and hey, it it appears to exist on Pluto. And of all the th- places in the in the solar system, it's just the most unlikely to find it. So if we find it there, it could mean that environments with liquid water are much more common than than um, than we may have originally thought, which is really really cool. But yeah, I mean, I love this mission. The the yeah. um, the, the the science that's come out of this, and also the way that the engagement has been handled with the public and and vi- and through the media and so forth. I think it was a very good experience for for most the science reporting has generally been pretty good on it as well i, I just i think it's a sign hopefully of of um of some of the awesome missions that are coming up over the next few years and there are a few that i'm really looking forward to and and this mission is not finished you know it's been given a new target it will it'll it'll do another flyby and hopefully we'll get even more exciting data from uh, from other objects out there and still plenty of data to crunch Oh, I was just going to say, like, I, I, my, see, as a kid, I remember Pluto for some reason capturing my imagination. I don't even know really why, except for the fact that it was so far away and that we'd never actually gotten a direct image of it. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, we had this book when I was a kid, like, about the planets, and it described Pluto and Charon. And it said something along, along the lines of, oh, you know, they're both, they, and obviously this is a place, this was at a time when all we had of, all the, the only knowledge we have had of Pluto was a little dot, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And they basically extrapolated from that and said, "Oh, you know, they're, they're two little rocky worlds. They circle each other in their lonely, far, in their lonely little corner of the solar system, doing nothing. Basically, you know, just two <laughs> two little deserts, you know, desert worlds, bathed by this little pinprick of sunlight, doing nothing. Mm. And then when we, and then when New Horizons sped past it, and we got all these images, and we re, and they realized this is actually a really dynamic place. Yeah. It was crazy. Like I remember re- everything we got back from it. I was like." This happens on this place this far out. What? <laughs> it was nuts. Yeah, and, and 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 the fact that it even like it even made the Herald Sun. Like that, that's what got me. That's what got me. It was, like, it was actually in the Herald Sun, and it was crazy. I'm like, this is brilliant. Like, you know, this beautiful picture of Pluto it was great. Anyway. All right, and I think let's finish off with the astronomy news with Tabby Star. This is the the weird alien megastructure star that isn't an alien megastructure uh it's just one of those stars that is there's at least two or three stories that we talked about where something new some theory was either posited or disproved or there's so much unknown about this weird star this is absolutely the wtf story of the year (laughs) i think because because that's what it's called (laughs) (laughs) yes um but but also we we just we may never know. That's the thing with this, at least not in our lifetime. If this, um, if you don't recall what's going on with Tabby Star, basically it has a very irregular pattern of becoming dimmer and then brightening it up again. There are all sorts of things that can cause a star to, to dim and then brighten. And we generally understand those processes quite well. But one thing that, that tends to be true for most of those different processes is they are on a schedule. They are quite regular with, with the with the causes. One of them that we love to see is is, is transits. When something, you know, a, a, usually we, we, you know, we would find a, a planet going in front of the star. And that just, the planet moving in front of the star, if we just happen to be lined up just right, means that the star's light will dim ever so slightly. And then from that, we can extrapolate, you know, how big is this planet that's going in front of it. For that to be considered a, a, a transit of a planet, we need to see it twice so we can get an idea of what its year is. So when we see something that's that's sort of dimming over a period of weeks or months and then and then getting brighter again and then dimming again, it's like, what the heck is going on here? This is just bizarre. And of course, it led to a whole lot of theories being thrown out there that, hey, maybe this is a sign of a Dyson sphere. And that's that's actually come from a, a place of, of, you know, solid science because it was proposed years before this detection that, hey, if there was an advanced alien civilization out there, one way that uh, we may be able to detect them is if they built the Dyson sphere. So this was something that was proposed long before. But they, if they built the Dyson sphere, this is what a detection might look like. 
and that's basically quite similar to what we're seeing with this star. So, you know, it's not like it was, hey, maybe it's a thing. It's like, well, you know, we've already got this guy whose name I forget. I apologize to him. Um, but we've already got this guy who has suggested that, that a, um, an, an alien civilization with a Dyson sphere, a detection would look like this. And that's kind of what we're seeing. But will we know? Well, maybe eventually, but uh, it's a really hard thing at the moment to, to kind of tie down. What we do know is this is something that is not currently easy to explain. But if you just look at, um, or basically, if you just consider Ockham's razor, there's so many things we have to eliminate first, including things we just don't know about yet. Um, so it's 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 very engaging as a story for that reason alone, because we, we don't know. And, and maybe someone will come up with something, or maybe another observation of some other object will help us explain what's happening. Personally, and as I said on the show before, I'd love it to turn out to be something in between us and the star that's heading towards us and occasionally sort of eclipsing the star. That would be really cool but then again it could also be really bad <laughs> but um, an alien invasion I, I was just thinking I'm suddenly, I'm suddenly <laughs> living in the fifth element <laughs> but it would also have to be something really really big even if it was way closer to us than the star because we are not in a single point uh, of space we are moving so you know you have yeah. to consider that the, the earth moving from from one extreme of its orbit to the other in between six months that's quite a big area plus our sun is actually moving up and down and around um the the center of the the milky way so you know just looking at the alignments of things that's an incredibly unlikely story but it would be cool we don't know uh, aliens, possibly. Who knows? But uh, probably, probably not. Probably something much more well, mundane. I mean, but just the fact that it is so irregular, like it's just, and it's not predictable, is really cool. Like as you yeah. said, most things in the universe seem to operate on a very defined schedule, and this one doesn't. So, but and also, wasn't there? Maybe I'm just imagining things. But didn't they find another star, or they possibly saw another star that was behaving similarly to this? And I can't remember which one it was. For the life of me. I don't recall. Yeah, it doesn't that. ring a bell. I, I it is certainly me, possible. There are lots of other that fake news that uh, goes stars that vary their brightness. Mm. Yeah, fake news. It was it was post truth uh, reporting there. <laughs> post truth. <reporting. laughs> <No>. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it could be something as mundane as. Um, I mean, it's so incredibly well, unlikely, but, but there are a lot of stars out there. But it could be something as mundane as we are. Uh, we we might have some objects out in the Kuiper Belt or in the Oort Cloud even, which just happens to line up and just happens to be on a on a on a orbital velocity that that just keeps kind of getting in the way of this star. I mean, we do know that some planets, so even some of the planets, if you look at them in the sky, they they don't appear to move compared to the stars very much, night by night, because <laughs> they're so far out. So mm-hmm. you know, it could be something as mundane as that. But there there, this is the thing. There's so many potential mundane explanations for this that would just be down to a little bit of uh, chance alignment. And and we rely on chance alignment for to find exoplanets as one of the ways we do it. So it could happen. But um, it's kind of cool to think of uh, other possibilities. Definitely. Well, this year also saw a lot of exciting medical breakthroughs, uh, including a medication that could see the end of three parasitic infections for Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, and sleeping sickness. Joe, this is this is like a new hope uh, for it's something ridiculous, like thirty thousand uh, sufferers of these. More diseases, than that, I think right? there's a, 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 a approximately fifty thousand people are killed every year, and they um, between the three parasites, there are around twenty million people affected every year, and and that's one of the reasons I thought that this story was so important because you know the, the, there's so much work going on looking at treating disease but ultimately it's people who live in third world countries that I think are predominantly affected by so many of these parasitic uh, mm. conditions and uh, you know anyone who's listened to Carl Zimmer will know that anything to do with parasites is gr- pretty gross so <laughs> anything that'll um, that'll help alleviate some of the suffering that people experience um, from being infected with these conditions is is a good thing. So yeah, I mean it it, it it's certainly in its early stages. It was um, it was a compound that's been developed by um, the drug company Novartis and came about after testing some absurd number of uh, different compounds. I think something like they tested something like three million different compounds before coming up with this one. And and what is so 
so unusual about it is that it has the potential to target the, you know three different parasites. They uh, apparently, um, you know, one one of the problems is that a lot of the existing drugs that can treat these infections, you know, have significant toxicities, and in order to give them, they've usually got to be given intravenously, which is very difficult in countries which are very resource poor. So, uh, you know, and they don't explicitly say so, but I'm assuming that this will be something that could be administered orally. And they're not 100% certain, in fact, that in the long term, it will turn out to be administered as one medication. But but certainly, it's very promising um, in terms of being able to target these three different parasites. And it does so by uh, targeting proteasomes, which essentially degrade uh, damaged proteins in uh, in the um in the cells so I suppose it's a watch this space. It's it's not actually up to phase one trials yet. Um, they're still, I think, only doing animal testing, and it certainly, I think, was very promising in mice. But um, uh, hopefully, they'll be able to do some phase one trials in the near future, and it'll, you know, it'll hopefully make a difference. I think the other cool thing about this was that they were able to discover these compounds by testing over three million other compounds yes, yes. to get the ones that worked. Exactly, which just shows the sort of doggedness, painstaking tenacity that's required for oh, this sort of absolutely. Uh, and I think I think that's one of the discovery. things that people often don't realise about, you know, putting putting aside some of the criticisms that get levelled at pharmaceutical companies and certainly you know, there are times when they're very much deserved, but the 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 you know, the basic science that goes into developing these drugs, the you know, the level of discarding of information that has to go on before you actually find something that's useful is incredibly time-consuming and incredibly expensive. So, yeah. you know, to, to, to actually get to something useful is a, is a massive undertaking. Yeah, it's very cool. And uh, we'll have to follow that and mm. see what happens in a few years' time. But speaking of pharmaceuticals, also this year, the FDA announced a ban on the use of uh, triclosan, the common antibiotic found in many soaps. Shane, this is, it's only going to be in soaps and not uh, other, like, I think, shampoos and things and that also yeah, use it. I mean, yeah, it was, it was big news at the time because it was, this has been a very long um, lobbying uh, thing by environmental activists and a lot of healthcare professionals who sort of have argued for years that we don't actually need these things in common soap because we don't need the, that higher grade of antibacterial in, regu- in something that you use every single day. Like this is, this is hospital grade stuff hmm. as far as I understand. And um, it's stuff that just gets washed off. It's not even on your yeah. hands for very long anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and there's been, I mean, repeated studies have shown that there is actually no difference in, well, it doesn't have any real benefit over regular soap for like regular use. And there are some indications that it could be harmful. So I suppose it was, yeah, it made massive news because it was one of those things that all of a sudden this whole industry is now going to change its entire, <laughs> it's in, you know, the makeup of all of its products. So it is big, it's a big deal for them. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure how, how far that's got. I'm not sure if that's a binding thing now. I'm not sure if it's stuck up in the courts at the moment. Oh, really? I, I hadn't heard anything. Similar, it's, it's a similar decision to the, just to the decision to remove microbeads yeah. as well. Okay, so. which is still stuck up as well because it's not, yeah, it'll, yeah, it'll probably be stuck for years while they try to hammer out the ins and outs of it. And, but yeah, I mean, obviously the, the lobby groups who are for this, uh, you know, very much against this ban because A, it's bad for their business and B, because they argue that well, it's been used for years and it's safe and effective. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's a funny one. It's at least a good decision that's been made and obviously we'll see how it pans out. But it's, it's a step in the right direction. I suppose that in the interim, you know, while they're waiting for it to make its way through the courts, the um, the lobby groups that have actually succeeded in, in getting these um, these um, substances removed from these products should focus on educating the public about choosing alternatives in the meantime, you know, and that, that's one way to actually make a difference while they're waiting for the products to come off the shelves. You know, I mean, I, I know that when I, you know, when I go to the supermarket and buy soap, I go out of my way to look for something that does not contain an antibacterial and, and people need mm-hmm. to know to actually do, to actually do that. Yeah. And why we yeah. do that as well. Yeah. That's the other important thing. Like it's, yeah. So, I mean, the common perception is that, you know, like, and you see it even advertised here and quite recently is that, you know, you know will kill 99% of germs is, you know, is safe, mm-hmm. it's effective, you know, it, it's better than normal soap. And there has to be a sort of an education push as to, well, why is this not 
an issue. Exactly. And why and why can it also be harmful if you keep pushing it? And that's the that's the hard part. It's similar, and and again, I keep sort of finding similarities here, but it's similar. It reminds me a little bit of the whole issue around SPF in sunscreen and, you know, people thinking that, you know, more is better and not realizing that it actually doesn't make any difference. And and it's a similar kind of concept here in, in the public have this perception when it comes to germs that, you know, killing 99.9% of bacteria is actually sort of something that is meaningful when it, it, it really isn't. Well, yeah, I mean, A, that's the number they, you know, th- I think they use that against like lab strains. Yeah, for a yeah. st- that's how they get that number in the first place. So it, it's absolutely meaningless when it comes to the bacteria that's in your house exactly. and on yeah. your surfaces. And B, you probably wouldn't want to get rid of 99.9% of bacteria on any surface, including mm. yourself. No, no. Because let's face it, you, you know, your normal flora is kind of there for a reason or it's not, you know, A, it's not doing you harm. B, if you get rid of it, it leaves room for other things exactly. to you know, come and take their place. So, yeah, but trying to explain this in a simple way that's also effective engaging to the public mm. is kind of hard. And, yeah, it's sort of up to us, you know, as scientists and communicators to do that, but it's, it's, it's extremely hard to do effectively, really. So. Which I think is a, as good a lead-in as any to talk about the study that suggested Dyson hand dryers could spray you with 1,300 times as many germs as paper towels. Not that paper towels spray you with germs. But anyway, the point was that they were suggesting that Dysons were dangerous, that they would be um, spraying out a big cloud of virus particles. The, the big problem with this study was it turned out, as we were discussing it on the show, of course, Peter Miller pipes up and says, yeah, I had a look at the paper and there's a big conflict of interest thing saying one of the two lead researchers has been paid by the European Tissue Symposium, which is the trade association. <laughs> Wait, I love that, that exists. <laughs> I know. I didn't even know that was a thing until he said it. I'm like, wow, okay. Well, I feel like an idiot now. <laughs> the trade association representing the majority of tissue paper producers throughout Europe who kind of have a vested interest in people not getting the Dyson uh, Airblade machines. It's and Sorry, it, no, doesn't- it, it doesn't discredit the study completely. But it casts a shadow over it. That means how much can you really trust yeah. it? Yeah. So I mean, looking at their experimental setup, it does seem well. They were very thorough. Mm. They basically set up. I think you know they they set up sort of zones of you know blowback essentially, and they cultured you know they took swabs off those zones and cultured them and saw how many bacteria or viruses grew up. And you know, it, <laughs> I don't, from memory, I don't think the numbers were that worrying. It was just a, obviously a it was a slightly higher number, but I'm not even sure if it was statistically significant. That being said, this yeah, the the fact that there is a vested interest in this does all automatically cast a pall over it. Well, it means that you can't trust anything in that paper. You cannot trust the data that they've given. You cannot trust the methodology that they did that they stuck to it necessarily. You just uh, this is a a single paper relies on trust. Mm. And if that trust is broken, then you have to look at replications of the study in other papers because this is, it's discredited. But as Shane said, the the methodology seems fairly easy Mm. to replicate. I don't see anything hard. I mean, and reading the results, it does seem like I I said, I I was worrying worrying about the significance of the figures, but looking at it, so yeah, 60% more plaques virus production than. Mm. of Dyson hand dryers compared to um, using paper, which seems to make sense. I mean, if you think about it, obviously, you know, when you're <laughs> talking about spreading particles around, a high-intensity jet is going to obviously blow around more particles than, than a paper towel, right? Mm. Whether or not that's then that then translates to dangerous spread of pathogens is another matter altogether. And this is some a criticism that, um, that Dyson themselves levelled at this, this uh, study because they were saying, well, this, it was artificially high, mm. you know, absurdly high levels of pathogens. Yeah. Uh, Didn't reflect that, a that, real that world. Realistic. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, if, if, if the intent was to show that this is possible, that they could be spread, mm. it reminded me a little bit of a, of a Mythbusters episode. You know, it's like, well, now we've got to ratchet it up so that we get meaningful <laughs> results. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. otherwise we're looking at one part per, you know, X million yeah, exactly. to find... You know, so yeah, maybe they have ratcheted it up to to see what the actual spread is. Because if that was the if that was what they were looking for is what's the spread and how far does it go, then it probably doesn't really matter. They could have used dye. You know what I mean? It doesn't. And in fact, really they probably. Matter, to be honest, they probably should have. 
something like that would have been a bit better because obviously as soon as you start saying, oh, you know, we, we cultured this many more things off, you know, using this method and that method, but not, but not stating what those things you're growing are. Like if it's just E. coli, which is common E. coli, which basically is everywhere, or, you know, something that's easily grown in the lab, but th- th- what does it matter? Like, you know, if you'd said, if they'd made a real world thing and said, oh, we managed to cultivate, you know, a oh, horrible diarrhea causing bacterium using yeah. this method, then that would be something we'd worry about. But mm-hmm. they, I think they just used a lab strain of E. coli, which obviously grows really well and is really easy to report on. Yeah. Mm. yeah. To be honest, I, I actually, you know, and I suppose for me as a nurse, because hand washing is such an important part of my work, I have often, whenever I go into public toilets and so on, I'm just really struck by, you know, the other things that concern me other than the, the hand dryers, like the fact that there's maybe no soap or that the water mm. is mm-hmm. so, the water pressure is so low that you can't effectively wash your hands. And, you know, there are so many mm. things in the design of public toilets that actually don't facilitate good hand washing. The fact that you have to put your damn hand on the handle yes. and pull the door towards yes. you to get out. What the yes. hell is wrong with designers of closed doors? Have an outward opening door so you can use your butt Cle- to open clearly, the door. Clearly, <laughs> so clearly you haven't mastered the art of, you know, carrying like a cl- piece of clean paper towel to open the door with. Well, yeah. that's the thing. That, that's the thing. You end up having to do that, and then you're standing there with a paper, piece of paper towel, and there's not a there's not a, a <laughs> in the hallway. <laughs> this is, and then you have to try and launch the paper towel across the room to get it into the bin. It's that's assuming there is paper towel, and they right. haven't switched to hand dryers. Just, you might have to open. You might have to rip the Dyson off the wall and wow. that to open the door, <laughs> and then throw it across. I strongly suggest against that. That's like putting your hand into the pool of bacteria in order yeah, to do no. that. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Um, I think the bottom line, though, wash your hands properly. Yes. Because it doesn't matter how much it will spread around if there's no germs on your hands in the first place. Yeah. I think that's the, the, yeah. the takeaway yeah. from it. Well, g- going back to the story we were talking about before about the, you know, the triclosan, that, that's essentially what that was the FDA's recommendation in the first place was, you know, yeah. <laughs> wash your Soap hands. Soap and water. Wash Soap your hands and water. <laughs> wash your hands thoroughly, yes. Yeah. yeah. And just to clarify, unlike a Mythbusters experiment, at no time did they explode the air dryers. It wasn't anything like that. I just, <laughs> they should have done. They should. <laughs> it is disappointing they didn't do that. I think all scientific studies should end with explosions, <laughs> but um, controlled, obviously. I miss that show so much, uh, especially psychological ones. They should just end the experiment with, "Okay, well, you failed wow. to identify." <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> dark place. <laughs> oh dear! I, I think I was thinking more of the uh, uh, Peter Venkman, uh, you know, beginning of Ghostbusters, where it's like, no, you've got it wrong again. You know, the psycho, uh, creepy on a number of levels. Yeah, uh, let's yeah. move on, or we will never finish the show. Uh, the other medical breakthrough, I think, that we should talk about was the blood test that was developed that can quickly determine if you have a bacterial infection and therefore need antibiotics, or if it's a virus and antibiotics won't help you at all. I thought this was really cool because so many GPs will just prescribe antibiotics whether or not you need them because they haven't got time to take a blood test, send it to pathology, get the results back, determine whether or not you've got uh, a bacterial infection or a viral infection, and then treat accordingly. So... That could be a, a yeah. No, I thought this was really cool because, as as you said, it's such a, a major problem dealing with antibiotic resistance, and um, it, it it is very very challenging for doctors to be able to know when to prescribe antibiotics and when not to, especially when you've got a patient sitting in front of you demanding them, which as we know they do. Um, so uh, mm-hmm. what the scientists at Stanford have done is um, they looked at more than a thousand uh, blood samples, and they've identified seven genes which will allow them to distinguish between uh, viral and bacterial infections. The thing that I couldn't quite gather from this is how quickly they can get these results because ultimately you're still left with the problem of having to do a blood test and, you know, you're not going to be able to get that result immediately. You're still going to have to send off a blood test and wait for a result. So you're not going to – you still got – you still do have the problem of the patient sitting in the GP's office demanding something now but at least i suppose it does give some certainty to whether your you know the treatment you're using is actually useful except that i like I, well i work in pathology yep. and i know there can be up there can be like a two-day turnaround yes. 
between getting the blood test results. Yeah. So if this is yet another two day turnaround, some in, in the meantime somebody could be you know have a horrible infection, yeah. and you wouldn't necessarily know, or they might be developing one. And obviously, you know these 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 infections can literally ramp up within a day or two. So hmm. that's yeah, that would be my worry too. Like if they had an on site, you know, exactly. detection system where you could say within say 15, 20 minutes if you've got this or not. But I'm not sure, like, I, I, I'm looking at the paper and I can't figure out if they used, like, what sort of thing they used to detect this. It was a PCR test or was it just a quick colour change test? I'm not yeah, sure. I, I couldn't quite tell from, um, from what was there either. Uh, you, you'd be more equipped to do yeah. that than I am. But nonetheless, again, yeah, it, it seems like... Not necessarily. <laughs> I'd hope so. Um, but it's, it just seems like at face value, it looks like a really fantastic solution to a really important problem. But when you actually tease it out, eh, doesn't doesn't really quite get there yet. It depends. If they're using gene expression and if there's some way to quickly do a color change assay yeah. for, these, for these seven targets. And, you know, say you can do this. I'm just pulling numbers out of my out of thin air here. But say we can do this. Within a time frame of when the patient's going to be in the doctor's office waiting in the, in the surgery, yeah, or in the surgery, and if they could do this that quickly, then fine, that that'd be great. I'm I've got a funny feeling they can't do that quite yeah. yet, but I suppose this is one of those validation things that says, okay, this is the potential that we've got, and in the future we could definitely apply this so we don't just we don't just give this patient you know the highest grade antibiotic we can on the off chance they might have a septic infection. Yeah, and, and certainly yeah, I think, I think that, that's exactly it, is that I think a lot of these discoveries are really just showing us that there is a potential for something there that with, with enough, you know, enough work that they could potentially develop something that, you know, will be, you know, yeah. bedside results. I mean, you know, you think of, for example, you know, when you these days when you go and um, donate blood, there are little, you know, finger prick tests that they can do now that they were never able to do before in terms of just getting a sort of very basic iron level or, um, you know, various other things. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, it'll be, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how far this where this mm. goes and if they actually because yeah, it is it is still a massive problem that we get over prescription of antibiotics even now even though people have a much better understanding and doctors have a much better understanding mm. of antibiotic resistance and the, and the pitfalls of it if you keep prescribing these yeah. very strong antibiotics yeah. for something that may or may not be a problem but even so it's it would it would still cause it would still basically enable us I think to lengthen the time we can use these antibiotics. Hopefully. Which is a real problem at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm. And I think our last uh, story the, for the show, the, the big story of the year, was all about Tasmanian devils, our little furry friends that are struggling with the deadly facial tumour. Uh, there were two big stories about these where one shows that they're evolving to deal with this cancer and given time it might not be a problem. They could sort of evolve to coexist with it. The other story was all about how there's another population, an isolated population that hasn't been affected yet that has been discovered, which could mean there's this isolated chance to clone them, essentially. Yeah. Um, should we deal with the second bit first yep. about the, the isolated population? Because I remember, I remember talking about this before, that the, the, um, the discovery was based on the on on only the discovery of some scat on some some droppings from from these devils and there was there were genetic markers within the the scat that that um, indicated they were a, they had some some different um, you know combination of genes and the, one of the biggest issues one of the biggest problems facing the devils is the fact that they actually have very little genetic diversity so when something like this which is a transmissible form of, of cancer a tumor um, that can that can move from one devil to another and unfortunately they have this social behavior where they bite each other's faces as a part of their you know I don't know <laughs> just getting along or whatever um it, it's it it spreads and it has spread like wildfire through the population of, of wild devils so you know one of the biggest fears that scientists has were, was with such low genetic diversity and and thus um uh, the the you know the likelihood of, of, of some particular subset of devils having uh, some, some natural resistance to this, it, it means that their chances of, of, of weathering the storm are significantly shortened. You then look at the predictions and the reality of the decline of the devil population 
which has been significant. They've lost a massive percentage of their of their um, entire population. I can't remember. I think it was something like eighty percent, about eighty percent, and ninety percent in some some other areas where they used to live. I mean, that's that that is horrifically big uh, impact on their population. So to find indications of of a of a, of a different a slightly different genetic um, makeup in in a population is very encouraging, but that in and of itself is not enough. That just because they're slightly genetically different means it doesn't mean at all that they're going to be resistant to to the um, to the facial tumors. But what was very encouraging was the rate at which the devils were evolving. Mm. This is not something that had been anticipated. They they have actually. You know, it's amazing how life finds a way, and life seems to find a way with the devils because they've found uh, that, that some part of the population are, are actually starting to develop a recovery to this, which is which has not been the case before. So that that's a really encouraging thing, and it means that the the other mitigation methods that that they've got going on which are the re-release programs and and putting devils in safe harbor and and like a uh, i forget the name of the program but basically they've they're putting them in a, like a an arc if you like so that they can re re-release them if all the the wild devils get uh wiped out uh, we may not be down to that there, there may be some other um you know some other hope for the devils but yeah it's uh it's an interesting story that would I, I guess we've we've sort of followed it from the beginning mm. uh in in the case of the the the, um, the tumor i think they first reported it in the mid 90s didn't they like this this facial tumor and, and how it spread yeah yeah um, mid 1990s yeah but what, and what gets oh, i'm surprised it's been, been that long I, i'm yeah. i yeah i so i am just looking at a um uh, a, a map at the moment of the detections and yeah 1996 in the top uh, northeastern corner of Tasmania at Mount William. And what what gets me most the most about the the evolution of them is that so this this sort of targets sexually mature devils mostly. So and apparently yeah. this has cut their average sort of you know, birthing rate, I guess. So I, I think I think every, a female um, Tassie devil gives gives birth to three litters during her lifetime on average, mm-hmm. and now this has been cut to generally one because of mm-hmm. the, the the you know the the way this disease is spread and killed. And yet, even with this lower birth rate, you're still getting this evolution of a you know to overcome this, which is really cool. And and, and as Lucas said, unprecedented because as as we said with the shallow gene pool of these animals, it shouldn't really happen that fast, but it has. Yeah. It also shows that evolution can happen over smaller time frames when you have smaller generation times, and also intense pressure which yeah, this is yeah. like, this is a massively intense selection pressure so yeah well Great. i think we've ended the show on something of a high note <laughs> an optimistic note at least i yep. <laughs> i year, could you know. go through all of the uh examples of bad media reporting or bad science that we had listed here but i'm not going to depress you all with that i think we'll, we'll <laughs> we've harped on about that long enough this year have we so <laughs> fair enough Okay. Next year is going to be uh, very interesting from a uh, post-truth point of view. <laughs> but uh, we'll deal with that next year. Of course, you can get all the uh, information on the stories we talked about today at scienceontop.com slash 252. And there you can find all the ways to get in touch with us and spread the word on social media and leave a review on iTunes. Thank you, Joe Benamu, for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It's been lovely as always. And of course, thank you, Shane and Lucas. No worries. Thank you. No worries. This episode was edited with an unfathomable amount of patience, time and effort by the very talented Marcos Benamou. Have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, everyone. We'll be taking a short break, but we'll be back again probably around the end of January. But in the meantime, of course, we'll have our bloopers episode. So keep an eye on scienceontop.com for that. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next year, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Um, Hello. Hello. What? Why are we all saying hello? Because you went all wonky again. Yeah. I'm not wonky. You're wonky. (laughs) You're wonky. You're all wonky. (laughs) I'm wonky. 
Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, this, Marcos, you don't actually have to do anything for the bloopers episode. Just upload this yeah. and we're done. Yeah. <laughs>